appointments. Oops. She is one of the most outspoken advocates for the preservation and celebration of Long Island history with an emphasis on BIPOC heritage, that is for Black Indigenous people of color. Dr. Greer Key has been elected, a various, elected to various organizations that inform and further the study of art, history, preservation, and culture. As a founding member and lead organizer of the Pyrus Counter Action Committee, her continued role is leading to the rebuilding of the formerly enslaved Pyrus Concert Homestead in the heart of Southampton's village. Presently, she serves as the president of the town of Brookhaven's NAACP branch. Welcome Dr. Georgette Greer Key. And our second um, panel person today, we have Candace Penn. She's an educational consultant and retired educator with 30 years of experience. She's provided diversity, equity, and inclusion training to educators and school-related personnel in public and private educational settings. Candace became a master early childhood educator, utilizing her strong foundation in the pragmatics and fundamentals of teaching while enjoying many leadership roles over her career. She is the current president of the Westchester Alliance of Black School Educators. Under her leadership, the Westchester Alliance of Black School Educators raises th thousands of dollars annually to fund scholarships for college-bound high school seniors. Candace is a native of Brooklyn, New York, and holds a Bachelor of Science in General Engineering from Tufts University, a Master's in Science in Computer, si Computer Science from, the New, York, from New York University College of Engineering, and a Master of Arts in Education from Columbia Teachers College. She has four adult children, three sons and one daughter, and she and her husband reside in Mount Vernon, New York. And we would love to welcome Candace Penn. Our first speaker, Dr. Georgette Greer, will be sharing a lot of history with us. So pay close attention because there's a lot of information about African-American history in Long Island. So I'd turn it over to Ms. Dr. Georgette Greer. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. This is such a great collaboration, and I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, and I just want to send a shout out to um, the NAACP. I've seen many people come on who are still joining in, um, and I'm so very happy to be with you. I do have a PowerPoint, and I want to take this opportunity to talk about some sites on Long Island. When we think about our history here on Long Island, we have to think about when we first came. We can date back early to the 16, 1626, um, when we think about New Amsterdam, and then when we think on Long Island, we see the first time that um, enslaved Africans came to our shores is in 1651 to Sylvester Manor and, and on, uh, on um, Shelter Allen. So I'm sure we're gonna be dropping links in for you, but I would love for you to look at um, Sylvester Manor, which is the first provisioning plantation in the Northeast. And you're welcome to visit that place. And many of the um, persons that I'll be talking about today, their lineage comes from Sylvester Manor, a person that you have probably heard of when you think about Jupiter Hammond. He comes from that lineage where his parents were there working on that plantation. And so some of you may say, well, what about, um, what is it about um, a provisioning plantation and what does that mean? Well, the provisioning plantation was created so that all of the land that was in the Caribbean would be used specifically to actually grow um, the sugarcane. They didn't want to waste any land um, to, for provisions, so for food, for animals, for growing. And so they had to do that here on Long Island. Um, I guess I'm supposed to share my own. I thought I was going to have somebody. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can share for you. You want me to share it? Oh, you got it? Okay. I think I got it now. Okay. I was waiting. I was trying to talk until it came up, but I got it now. So um, it was introduced. I was introduced early. Yes, I am the president of um, the Brookhaven Town NAACP, and I'm also the executive director of Eastville Community Historical Society, um, which is in Sag Harbor. 
Um, and so I would love for you to visit this spot. Now, you, I'm looking at this image and you know I always say, what is it about this image? Well, our society represents the indigenous, the African-American and the European immigrants that came to settle this area, which we refer to as Eastville, which is east of the village in Sag Harbor. So we have a population of indigenous folks, Montaukit and also Shinnecock that are members of our organization. When the Montauks got pushed out of Montauk illegally and by law, they settled in the Eastville area, which they would normally be there during the winter months um, and then live on the shore during the summer months. So that's how this organization got started. We have a cemetery and our cemetery is also the first cemetery to be integrated. All of the other cemeteries in Sag Harbor um, are segregated. And so we have a church the St. David AME Zion Church, which was also built by these three. We have a collection um, called Collective Identity, and it furthers this message of us being together as far as the BIPOC community. Um, as Dr. Adams said, that is the Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And so not only are they interred together, they work together and they worship together. And so that is the story of Eastville. Um, and I'll get back to Eastville section in a little bit. Someone you may uh, not know of is Pyrrhus Concer. How many of you have heard of Pyrrhus Concer before? I know I can't see you wave your hands, but not many people are. Well, he's so important to us because enslaved persons normally didn't have two names. If you look at manumission papers and different things like that, you'll see that there's one name. Well, he has a long genealogy that we trace back. Um, he was born uh, in March um, after 1799. So if we think about that date, what does that mean? If you were born and you happen to have some melanin in your skin, you were considered an indentured servant because uh, indentured servant by your mothers because she was enslaved. So whoever was born to an enslaved person after 1799, um, July 1799, they will be considered indentured. And I know this is a nuance. And when I say an indentured servant, I put up my brackets. Um, because when you think about indentured, indentured is something where it is a debt you incurred. And how do you incur a debt when you're just being merely born? Um, and so when I think about uh, Pierce Concert, we have a complete record of his life. We see that he was sold at the age of five. But he was born free and indentured to a debt that he didn't incur. What you see before you now is an image of him where he was celebrated in the town of Southampton. And um, so not only was he important because of we can trace back his lineages to his grandparents, we know where they were born, to his parents. Um, and he is prominently uh, visible in the uh, Southampton community. When you think about the library, that was where he was born. We have a Pelletero uh, silversmith shop. He worked there. And this it was his homestead that he, he inherited from his grandparents. So this is such a legacy and a testament to Northern slavery that we don't often talk about. We don't have to go down South. We can come right here in our backyard. And so I, along with Brenda Simmons, who I know has joined us from the Southampton African American Museum, are working very hard to rebuild his homestead. Um, and so this was actually the property that was um, passed down to him that he inherited from his free grandparents who, who actually uh, negotiated uh, their um, freedom. And so let's move on to the next one. He is so important because of not just the lineage that we learned about today um, in regards to, we know his first name, we know his parents, we know every place that he worked in the village. And he also left a very important um, um, memorial fund that is still going on today at the Presbyterian Church for widows. He was a whaler, you know, so he goes from being a kid that worked in the farm and swept up in the uh, silver shop to actually going on this very important voyage to Yoshido Bay, which is, you know, today, uh, Tokyo. Um, and so this was an important vo voyage because as you see here, 
Um, this was the uh, ship Manhattan, where it was the first ship to be uh, visit Tokyo in 1845, where there was um, an embargo where you could not enter, no foreigners could enter that area. And so the story is that they were able to rescue two shipwrecks of Japanese soldiers, one 11 and then again another 11, and they were able to return them to the shore because of Pierce concert and other BIPOC uh, sailors, whalers who were on that, that journey with them. And so it wouldn't be to, uh, after many years, that voyage that they were allowed to bring back the soldiers, they were able to get provisions, they were surrounded by all of these Japanese boats that were tied together. They weren't really allowed to enter the inland, but the off, off the shore. And so the, the emperor and many people came to see this dark man, Pyrrhus Consul, because of his skin and his melodic voice. And so you'll see that story time and time again. And in Japan, they documented this very important, uh, this very important journey that he made. Um, and so this would open up the embargo. So once it was opened up and we wanted to open trade, it was this voyage that allowed that to happen. So he was on that ship. Very important to our um, international history as well. So this is the picture that you would have seen earlier. Um, and I hope you noticed the truck that's in front of it. We are not often, uh, honored in the built environment. And because of that, um, this house was going to be demolished. And so every day we would drive past and look at this truck and, and how this property would be demolished. And it's important for us to tell the story so it doesn't repeat itself again. Um, and so this is the very um, reason that we need to look at Pierce concert in his life. As you know, this house, I said earlier, and this land, of course, there's many um, built ons from the future, but this land was land and, that he inherited from his grandparents, which was unheard of at this time. So the house was demolished. We know that um, historic districts is a tool in preservation that we use to um, really save things that are important. But I guess some people didn't feel that his heritage was as important as others. And so the house was demolished. We were able to go in and save the original timbers because one, somebody said that it wasn't significant. It wasn't significant because it didn't have the traditional architectural, you know, goth, uh, you know, Greek revival and Gothic and all of these other things that we see on bu um, buildings that we determine are beautiful. Well, this structure and this land and this building is important because of this cultural icon that lived there and that did so much for the community. So we saved it. Um, I'm, making it I'm making it short because I don't have all the time in the world, um, but it was a long and hard fight and we are still fighting. But I wanted to demonstrate, when you think about what's historic, we had to go back in the record. We had to pull out an old postcard like this to say, this was his house. This was his homestead in a prime, prime location in the Southampton village where you, probably would not expect it, but there it was. And this is the structure um, that was to be demolished. And as you see, every day we would go there and document this, but we were able to salvage those timbers in order to, we, we didn't know what was gonna happen. We just said, we gotta do something. And at the end of it, we got the town of Southampton to purchase the lot back for $4.5 million. Um, but it was the village um, that gave the certificate for a demolishment. Um, so we had those timbers. We didn't know what was going to happen in the 11th hour. We got the save. We've done archaeology. And as you see here, this is the site. Now, I want to point out a few things with this site. Where you see the anchor here, this anchor, this was there across the street the whole time. And so when they said this is not a historic, oh, we're like, uh, excuse me, the anchor is across the street at the park and has been there since the 80s. Um, so that's just to point that out. And then we have done archaeology. When I talk to you about the trip to Japan, in the archaeology, we were able to find this calligraphy brush that definitely gives us um, the evidence that we need to prove our story. Um, and so after a long fight, Brenda Simmons and myself, we were able to get the land 
to be the second uh, landmark um, property that happened to be of African American descent ownership. And we also were able to rename the street. Um, so that's, and I'm giving you the short story, as you can imagine. Uh, there was a lot of things going on, a lot of sleepless nights and crying and many public hearings. And so this is important for us to make sure that we landmark the site, even though the house is being torn down, we are forging ahead to rebuild it. Um, and so this is his homestead. And, and we use that word very purposefully because that's what it was. Um, and so we want to make sure that they know this man, he was a whaler. He was a prominent um, resident of Southampton. And most of all, he left, he left a, la a lasting legacy with his philanthropist efforts. Um, so there we can go on and on, but it's just to wet the whistle a little bit. So I want to make sure that you remember Pyrrhus Concer, 51 Pond Lane. Okay. Now, um, another person of interest that you may want to know of is Jupiter Hammond. I'm sure some of you may have heard of him. Often people believe that Phyllis Wheatley was the first published African-American poet. Well, we have evidence that Jupiter Hammond was the first published African-American right here in our backyard in Lloyd Harbor. And, um, you know, again, his parents stayed back to uh, Sylvester Manor, which is in, in Shelter Island. So there's a lot of connections here. And again, I wanna point out his first and last name. Jupiter Hammond, we know who he is. We know his lineage and his heritage and what he was able to accomplish in the family. Um, and so we don't have to go far, go right to Huntington Village, go to uh, Lloyd Harbor where his birthplace is there. And also um, uh, when you think about preservation Long Island, they are at the Lloyd Manor where, which was also um, a provisioning plantation. Um, and so when you look at this, you understand that our history is connected and geographically the towns of how we're broke up now were not like that. Um, and so this is a project that we've been working on to really tell the full story about him. Yes, um, it was believed earlier on that he was someone that was, uh, you know, docile in, in slavery, but when you study his poems, he was not docile. He was calling into uh, um, you know, a scrutiny, how could you be a devout Christian and enslave your fellow man? Um, much like uh, Frederick Douglass did when his mother um, was older and aging and what that meant for her life. So Jupiter Hammond Project, you should go on there. You have to commend this organization because they're endeavoring to tell a fuller story, a fuller American story with inclusion. If you walked in that house many years ago, you wouldn't even know there were enslaved persons there because who gets to tell the story? The victor normally. But now we want to bring into focus these heroes that also should be recognized in the space that they worked and they lived in. Now, I'll bring you to some more current times. This is basically, I want to say, an extended um, descendant family. When you think of Sag Harbor, we don't often think that people like this live there. But going back during the Jim Crow and, and Jane Crow era, where African Americans did not have access to respite, and they were, you know, not able to go to the pool that everyone was able to go to, and even some pools were being, you know, filled in, they found refuge, dating back to the 1920s in Sag Harbor. Um, and so this is important that they have created five distinctive communities that we have honored, which is Sarah Harbor Hills, Azarest, Nineveh, and subdivisions. And why is this important? This is important because these are historically African-American communities that were possible because of Eastville, because when many of them were building their homes, they came to Eastville's area to stay and um, what we now call B&Bs, but they weren't called that then. Um, and so this is a very important history because I know that many of you may have followed Bruce Beach in California. African Americans have always wanted to have access to the water, but that was not always the case. And so looking at these historic communities and how they existed during an era where we did not have um, housing laws to protect us, which we don't see much later into the late 1960s. Well, they were doing it in the 20s, the 40s, and the 50s. 
They were doing this under tremendous odds. There were no mortgages for many people. If you were building, you think the price uh, would go up and, and go down different days? Well, inflation really had a hold on that. Um, and then the other thing, I think about the elders in this community that would tell us the stories about, imagine coming here from Brooklyn and Harlem and the Bronx, you know, where the, when there was no LIE under the dark of night where we had an active KKK on Long Island. Um, so the fact that this place still exists today and had recently been overtaken with um, development, right? Big developers building mini mansions, calling family members saying, hey, I can close on your house in a week. I have 800,000 cash. When some of the lots only went for a thousand or others, some of the younger generations didn't, you know, value living in the smaller houses. And just like that, you would sell 800,000 one week, you know? Um, and so I think what we've begun is a journey, a, a journey to talk about that magnificent thing that their ancestors did. Yeah, this was cutting edge. They planned from the beach a bus to go to the March on Washington. So many great things have happened in this community and we think it's worth preserving it. Again, another fight of preserving our history in a built environment. And we were able to see, receive national and uh, state recognition, but we have still fighting for the local designation, which protects um, the integrity of the community and create a sense of community. So I think I may have been running out of time. I just wanted to give you a tad bit. You're always welcome to come see us. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to enter it into the chat. And with that, um, I yield my time back. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Greer Key. Um, just a couple of things that I took from what you share. There's so many little bits and pieces of history here in Long Island. Just to mention a couple that you mentioned, Paris Concert, Jupiter Hammond Project, um, Huntington, Lloyd Harbor or Manor area, Sag Harbor. There's a lot of pieces of history here that I think are helpful for us to know. But even though it's just little tidbits you gave us today, there are probably many areas on Long Island that we could learn more about this history. Can you just share a couple of spots that people can hit? Because everyone knows of the huge Smithsonian African-American history um, African-American Museum down in DC, but there's areas right here on Long Island. Can you just share a couple that people can maybe check out? We're on break next week, people. Those who work in education, you can go to one of these places, check them out. Can you share just a couple of those? Sure, absolutely. Um, a few things come to mind. Like now, when we think about where we live, whether it's Nassau or Suffolk, we kind of have an idea, oh, well, this is where, you know, the Black people live. This is a historic Black community. Even they say that about Harlem. But that isn't always true because some of these communities happen to be Black because of white flight. If you don't believe me, look up Howard Stern. He grew up in Roosevelt. He talks about this in one of his movies. Um, and so when we think about that, some of the communities that have been for us, by us, created specifically for African-Americans, you know, I have two in mind, which is Gordon Heights. We have such a, a strong and sustaining history in Gordon Heights. That's one. And of course, I talked about the Sands community. We have pockets all over, whether it's Great Neck, when we think about Spoonie Hill, um, when we think about Amityville. But if you want to um, visit anything um, over this break, I would um, implore you to go to the Whaling Museum of Cold Spring Harbor. We currently have an exhibition on um, African-American whalers. It's called From Sea to Shining Sea, Whalers of the African Diaspora. I also welcome you to vis visit Lloyd Manor and to learn about Jupiter Hammond. Um, I think I see a fellow um, person where we think about Greenport. We have historic presence in Greenport. If you wanna understand how African-Americans lived on Long Island, which I may get some people mad, includes Brooklyn. Brooklyn is Long Island. This has the barrel system. Think about a place called Weeksville Heritage Center. Um, that is a place that you can go to. You can go, I'm sure we're going to be able to throw something in the chat. So Weeksville, Lloyd Harbor, where you can go and hear Malik work, recite um, the poem that Jupiter Hammond first published. It is 
it is extraordinary. Even if you go to the website of, of uh, Preservation Long Island, you'll get a plethora of resources that you can use in your classrooms and that you can share with other people. Um, and I also think if we think about um, many of the organizations that determine um, Black history, like ASALA, um, and you look at that website, it gives you resources. Another project that I um, are, you know, that I'm involved with, especially in this era of alternative facts, banning books, and changing curriculum, I use the Zenith Project. The Zenith Project helps you um, teach this history in a way that is proven with primary research. And the project that I have done with them is to work on um, using a place, a historical place that we know is a fact. So like my cemetery, that is a fact. You can go there and learn that history. And finally, I would be remiss if I did not talk about Amistad. When you visit the Montauk Lighthouse, you will see that the Eastville Community Historical Society has a lasting monument right there on site to let you know. Thank you, I'm Steven Spielberg for the movie, but it did not happen in Connecticut. They landed here on, in Montauk at Caludon Point. So it's important for us to think about this place-based history that we have. It is right here in our backyards. It is a part of the American narrative, whether it's maritime history, whether it's the economy that we actually help build here on Long Island, it's at your fingertips. Thank you so much for that. And actually that is a great segue for us because we have a short little video that we want to share before we talk a little bit more about the Amistad legislation with Candace Penn. But please take a look at this video and then we have one of our um, education committee members that is gonna talk a little bit more about Amistad and the curriculum that can go behind it. Today we're looking at the Amistad. Hello, welcome to the Daily Bell Ringer. Please don't forget to subscribe and take a look at the questions down in the description. Also, don't forget to check out dailybellringer.com for resources that go with many of the Bell Ringer videos. The Amistad, or La Amistad, which is Spanish for friendship, was a Spanish slave ship that was the scene of one of the most well-known slave uprisings of the 1800s that would eventually lead to the Supreme Court of the United States and a remarkable ruling. On June 27, 1839, the Amistad departed from Havana, Cuba, carrying 49 enslaved Mende people who had been kidnapped in Sierra Leone and forced into slavery. They had been transported from Sierra Leone, Africa, aboard a Portuguese slave ship, the Decora. Now in Cuba, they were on the Amistad being taken to the island of Puerto Rico to be sold. The voyage would take four days, and at some point during the voyage, the ship's cook had told the enslaved passengers who were shackled in chains that they were going to be eaten by the crew of the ship. On July 2nd, one of the enslaved Mende men, 26-year-old Singe Pie, or otherwise known as Joseph Sinke, freed himself using a loose nail to pick the lock on his chains. Sinke quickly helped others out of their chains. They then searched the bottom holds of the ship for any weapons they could find. They found a crate filled with sugarcane knives, which were basically large machete-like weapons. At approximately 4 a.m., they stormed the top deck, killing the captain of the ship as well as most of the crew. Realizing that they were at sea and had no navigational experience, they allowed two members of the crew to live and instructed them to sail back to Africa. They knew that on their journey from Africa, they had sailed away from the sun, so they ordered the Spanish sailors to sail towards the sun. The Spanish sailors, however, had other plans. During the day, they sailed towards the sun, but at night, they turned the ship west, basically doing a zigzag pattern that eventually would lead them towards the United States. For 60 days, they continued to sail and recall they only had food for a four-day voyage to Puerto Rico. But on August 26, 1839, the USS Washington spotted the boat off the coast of Long Island. They boarded the Amistad and found a ghastly sight as they found men barely alive and at least one of, one of the captives were, were dead on the deck of the ship. In total, they found 43 enslaved people still alive on the boat. They then found the two Spanish sailors imprisoned below deck, and immediately the Spaniards claimed that all the enslaved people on board were their property. 
they were all taken ashore at New London, Connecticut. Now, the whole incident might have ended there with the Spaniards being awarded custody of the enslaved people since technically slavery was still legal in the state of Connecticut at that time. However, leading abolitionists, and remember abolitionists were people who wished to abolish or end slavery, but leading Christian abolitionists in the area found out about what was happening and heavily publicized the incident to expose the evils of the institution of slavery. The abolitionists even organized the Amistad Committee, which raised funds to defend the enslaved captives of the Amistad in court. They organized a defense claiming that the captives were not guilty of mutiny and murder, but rather they were people kidnapped and simply defending their lives. And remember, the slave trade, not slavery, had been outlawed in America in 1808, so technically the Spanish were breaking the law. But still the case had to go to court to decide if the captives of the Amistad would go free or be returned into slavery. It became a national issue as everyone was following what was happening. President Martin Van Buren basically wanted the captives out of the United States to simply end the controversy. He pushed to send the captives back to Cuba and back into slavery as to appease those in the South that saw this entire case as being a threat to slavery itself. Yet when the case was heard in Hartford, Connecticut in late 1839, the judge decided the Africans had acted in self-defense and should be given freedom and returned to Africa. But President Van Buren challenged the decision and asked for an appeal in the circuit court, who actually, the circuit court upheld the decision, so then it went to the U.S. Supreme Court, which only had five justices at the time and most of them were slave owners themselves. So it did not look good for the captives and their abolitionist supporters. Interestingly, 73-year-old former President John Quincy Adams, who had not been a lawyer in a courtroom for 30 years, was so adamantly opposed to slavery that he offered to represent the Amistad captives before the Supreme Court. In the United States versus the Amistad, the defense based their case around the idea of natural rights, which are rights you are promised simply by being a human being, the rights that were written in the Declaration of Independence. On March 9, 1840, the Supreme Court handed down their decision and agreed that the captives had acted in self-defense and should be free. Many argue that the United States should pay for their return to Africa, yet new President John Tyler refused. But abolitionist groups raised the funds and on November 25, 1841, the captives of the Amistad departed New York City sailing home to Sierra Leone, nearly three years after their ordeal had begun. So with that, hopefully you learned something and thanks for watching. All right, guys, my name is Aiden Smith. I'm a social studies teacher at Longwood High School. Um, and uh, I think this is a, a really important resource. I use it um, in my US history course uh, when I teach early America. I go over the Amistad case. I think it's important to American history um, and it's important to see both uh, blacks and whites resisting the institution of slavery. Um, oftentimes I kind of pair it with questions, um, surrounding the issue of liberty. Um, I think liberty is a, is a, is a foundational principle, uh, throughout American history. And what are you willing to do to ensure your liberty? You know, um, when founding fathers say, give me liberty or give me death, they are considered patriots. Uh, what about these actions right here? I know, um, that's an important concept. Uh, what are you willing to do to ensure your liberty? So I think that that's, this, this video allows you to make those discussions. I think the film by Steven Spielberg, which is something that I also share um, the trailer to in my class um, is a good discussion topic as well um, because it, it shows the dignity of all the parties involved um, and the great lengths that they are willing to go to um, or to endure to, to kind of establish their liberty. Um, one of the questions that I would pose and I would like to also thank um, um, Dr. Greer for, for presenting this um, is that like one of the questions that I had was how come the ship, did, if it landed in Long Island, it ended up being, um, 
sent to New London, Connecticut? And why is the trial there instead of Long Island? So those are one of the questions that I would ask, but I think this is a great resource um, because it uh, you know, shows the black and white solidarity, it shows the humanity of the Africans, and it shows the great length uh, that they are willing to, the great sacrifice that they're willing to take to ensure their, their human dignity. So, um, and I think this is uh, great so far. And uh, I'm taking notes. And uh, like at Longwood High School, we have a Long Island history. So some of the resources you shared, Dr. Greer, I'm definitely gonna go back and uh, share with uh, the people who teach that course and see if we can get some of those ideas and some of those trips and some of those uh, concepts implemented. So thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to chime in. Thank you so much, Mr. Aiden. And again, more additional pieces of history here happening right here in Long Island that some of us may not have known about. But I'm gonna introduce Candace Finn. She's gonna share with us a little bit more information about the Amistad legislation and where that came from and possibly where it could go. I'm not sure if, um, are you gonna share the screen, April, or Ms. Penn? Uh, no, Candace will, but I think she's okay. having, one second, let me just okay. open her. Um, she should be able to share her screen though. Can you share the screen, Candace? Okay, try now. Stop now, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the unmute. Okay, um, sorry guys. So yes, I am Candace Penn and I'm gonna share my sound as well, right? Of course you'll need to hear it. And I just wanted to say thank you to um, Dr. Burke. I am um, a resident of Sag Harbor as well. And um, I have been vacationing there for the entire, my entire life and my grandparents built the home that we share. So thanks for the shout out to Sag Harbor. All right, so uh, sort of following in the same uh, vein about Amistad, you should know as an early childhood educator, I was constantly looking for stories of the enslaved. Um, to share with my students because we had the conversation um, with the education committee about why it is only in secondary um, that some of these people and topics are covered. So um, you should know that when I learned about the Amistad, I was most obviously interested in the young people. There were three um, children on that ship. And, and in my practice, I try to find children's stories. And so this is Sarah Margaret Kinson, and she was 10 years old. Um, when they when the ship was um, was was captured, and she took that trek across the um, Atlantic in her lifetime, four or five times, and she was a graduate at one point of Oberlin College, and so that is a fascinating story. And there's a children's book. Um, it is fictionalized, but it's it is based upon um, Sarah Margaret Kinson's story. And when I talk to young people, and I'm, I'm talking kindergarten because that's what I, what I taught. When I talk to young people about Sarah, it's sort of in the vein of fairness, of course, introducing this idea of freedom and slavery, which is very new to them, um, and how she was actually captured and brought here without her parents and so forth. And so they find that story of Sarah extremely interesting. Um, and I think that more of those stories need to be told to young children so that by the time they get to secondary level, it's not brand new information. So I just wanted to share a little about Sarah and you can certainly look up these, these resources. So the Amistad law named after La Amistad, um, it was uh, passed in 2005 and these were the reasons stated. It is the policy of the state of New York that the history of the African slave trade, slavery in America, the depth of the impact of the enslaved African in our society, the triumph of African-Americans 
their significant contributions to the development of the country is the proper concern of all people, particularly students enrolled in the schools of the state of New York. It is therefore desirable to create a state level commission. And so they created a commission and the intent of the commission was to study what exactly is being taught about this history, these bullet points in the schools in New York State and to make recommendations to the New York State Education Department. That is what the original law passed in 2005 was meant to do. Now there's obvious, obvious evidence to support why we need to include black history in the school curriculum. Um, but these are quotes right from the law itself that explain why during the period beginning in late in the 15th century through the 19th century, millions of persons of African origin were enslaved and brought to the Western hemisphere, including the United States of America. The enslavement of Africans and their descendants was part of a concerted effort of physical and psychological terrorism that deprived groups of people of African descent the opportunity to, to preserve many of their social, religious, political, and other customs. Slavery in this country continued with the legalization of second-class citizenship status for African Americans through Jim Crow laws. And so the rationale for the law goes on to say, the legacy of slavery has pervaded the fabric of our society. And in spite of these events, there are endless examples of triumphs of African Americans and their significant contributions to the development of this country. As you've heard from Dr. Gritke, there are many, many examples. And so therefore there needs to be a law to uncover this history. So these are testimonials that you're about to hear from a student first, an educator and a parent. The high school student answers the question, what have you learned about slavery? Where have you learned it? And how has it helped you to learn about yourself? I am aware that it began in America in the early 1600s, and it was extremely prominent in the South because of the large agricultural nature that existed in the South at that time. And growing up in school, I was always taught about how negative slavery was, but I never really understood the true horrors of it until I was a bit older and able to do independent research on my own. Um, and delving deep into these horrors, I, it was extremely eye-opening and awakening for me. And my knowledge on slavery also expanded during the summer of 2020 when we as a country were forced to reckon with the gross injustices that have been plaguing our nation for centuries. And learning about slavery truly aided in the understanding of myself because my own ancestors were enslaved. And so to know that there's a part of me that comes from that really played a role in shaping my identity. And I'm always mindful of the way in which I carry myself because I know that my ancestors only dreamed of being able to dance, educate, and express themselves freely without fear of persecution. And I, I am and I continue to be motivated by the resilience and strength that my ancestors showed during those harsh times and after as they went to build lives for themselves and define African-American culture with the little resources that they were given. And because of this, I always do my best to live with purpose and be intentional about all my actions and interactions with others. everyone. Um, so yeah, so I think that when answering um, and speaking to some of those questions, uh, one of the first times that I can remember when I realized that Black people were really left out um, of the curriculum was when I was young. I don't remember exactly how, but I know I must have been in like elementary school. I just remember one day my sister coming home and, and telling me about how she learned about this Black guy named Toussaint Louverture. And he you know how he freed Haiti and we're Haitian and so I was just so shocked and surprised because I just 
generally never really learned about anybody black when going going to school. So I was just so shocked. And she was in middle school, I believe, at that time. So I just couldn't wait to get to middle school so that way I can learn about <laughs> this black guy that you know she talked about. So that kind of gave me a little inkling because I felt something, you know, that surprise that I had told me that like something was missing. So there was like some kind of feeling there, but um, you know, that feeling lingered, but I never really connected all the dots until probably when I was uh, out of college uh, in my early 20s and um, I had moved to Brooklyn. I joined uh, an organization called um, the African Blood Siblings with a group of other young 20 somethings. And um, through them, I learned, I got involved with different organizations like the UAM, which is the United African Movement uh, in Brooklyn, where they would have different people come and talk about the history of Black people. And I just learned so much. Everything just blew my mind. Every week they had a different person in coming in. Um, and so during that time, I was also teaching. I was actually teaching social studies. And so that really crystallized to me how much we are just not included in the curriculum. I just realized the curriculum that I was working with they basically almost had nothing about us and not even the truth about us because the stuff I was learning at the UAM was definitely not in that curriculum and definitely wasn't in the curriculum that um, I got growing up. Education. Majority of what I have learned about African American history, I did not learn until I went to college and I had to choose those classes. Why is that? Why is African American history not a part of American history? African Americans built this country from the ground up. My ancestors' blood is embedded in the soil. We have to change the curriculum in schools across the country so that we may adequately educate our children. Reading about history is crucial to the future of this country. Learning about other cultures, ethnicities, and religions in schools should not be something that is up for debate. We cannot continue to whitewash education, creating generations of children to believe that one race of people are better than the other. Our differences should make us curious, not angry. At the end of the day, I bleed, you bleed. We are all human. That awful day that will now be a part of the history books, hopefully, let us not forget to add that horrific day to the curriculum that we teach our children. So, the Amstad Law, and I mean, of course, we could go on with testimonials. I'm sure everybody on this um, on this Zoom has a story about when they learned about something about African American history or diasporan history, and it probably was not in school. So, back in 2002, New Jersey passed the groundbreaking New Jersey Amistad Law, and in 2002. They formed an Amistad Commission, and this is the current Amistad Commission website. They formed um, a curriculum, and any teacher in the state of New Jersey can log in and pull down um, lessons um, for any grade level K through 12. And they've had three executive directors of the Amistad department, and the longest um, the longest tenure for any of those three was Dr. Stephanie James Harris's tenure. And we have worked with her diligently to craft amendments to the original law for 2023. So this is the New York State Amistad Law timeline. So as I said, New Jersey passed their law in 2002 and it was funded and a commission was established and they were on their way to making a curriculum. In 2005, three years later, New York State passed their Amistad law. It, however, was unfunded. It was in the um, Committee on um, Parks, Art, Arts, Tourism, and Culture, and there was no um, curriculum established and no resources for teachers. In 2009, when I became aware of the Amistad Law, I'd read an article by Winnie Hugh, New York Times, and she was pretty much exposing 
this New York State Amistad Commission for having done nothing. And the title of the article was Four Years After Black History Panel's Birth, It Is Work Is Still Deferred. Now note, this is one year after our first black president was elected. And it was on the heels of that, that Winnie um, wrote this article. 2016, New York State Education Department updated their social studies standards and they activated this Amistad Commission to produce a report um, in March of that year and establish a website that provided information on Black history. Again, no curriculum. In 2020, um, during the pandemic, George Floyd was killed. Students, citizens were taken to the street um, and the educational justice issues were being raised. And although WAPSI, my organization since 2009 had been writing to our legislators and our government officials, it was in 2020 that we were able to get the ear of an assembly person, Stephanie Zim Zinnerman, who was running for the state assembly. With Stephanie, we began conversations with New York State Ed around a curriculum. And we were told that there is no curriculum that can be handed down with by New York State Ed. They can only recommend that our um, best strategy would be to amend, update the Amistad law and have it um, passed through both houses and made law so that school districts across New York State would be compelled to use whatever curriculum was produced. And so in 2021, Assembly Bill 9399, um, which is now uh, 1939, 20 for 2023, um, was, was introduced. And Senate Bill 9443, we're awaiting the new bill number, was introduced, but neither, neither went passed through committee committee. So at this point, we are um, in communication with the education chair, um, assembly member Benedetto, and he's looking closely at Bill 1939, has promised to introduce it and um, put us with the speaker. So that's where we are with those amendments. So what is it that we want? In addition to what was stated before, Assembly Bill 1939 and its companion bill in the Senate calls for, we're calling this the new Amistad law, calls for a repeal of the existing law to move it from arts and cultural affairs and tourism and make it education law, create a state level Amistad commission with 20 members, appropriate amount not less than $1.4 million for the operation of the Amistad department both residing within New York State Education Department and appropriate funding sufficient to ensure that the Amistad Commission can carry out provisions of the law. And this would be the structure. So right now we have a board of regents that oversees the New York State Education Department um, and its commissioner. And the commissioner would be a member or his or her designee would be a member of the Amistad Commission along with the president of the Senate, speaker of the house and chancellor of the State University of New York, and then 16 public members. And together, this commission would appoint an executive director of what would be called the Amistad Department. And their whole role would be to market, create market and uh, provide professional development for the execution of an inclusive curriculum in Black history. So these are the next steps. Your support is absolutely critical. So we're asking that you talk about this legislation with your friends, colleagues, family members, affiliates, constituent groups, and in your communities. Make people aware that it exists. 
write to your representatives, your local representatives, um, and the chair of the Senate, um, the Speaker of the House, Carl Hasty, the President, I'm sorry, this chair of the Education Committee and the Assembly, that's Representative Benedetto, um, the Speaker of the House, Andrea Stewart Cousins, who is the President of the Senate, and your local representatives. And most importantly, on the local level, we educators have to, have to attend our school board meeting, ask about their diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. It includes um, inclusive curriculum. We have to, have to ask our boards about their compliance with the Amistad law. So if you need more information, you can always visit our, our um, web address is wapsynewyork, wapsynny.com. You can email me, Candace Penn. Um, I wanna thank you, April and speakers for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Candace. I know that 